Alhamdulillah, Ahmadahu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'kiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroi anfusina min sayyata amalina may yahdihillahu falamudillana wa may yu'lil falahadiyana wa shuroi an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la shirikala wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu thumma amma ba' so now inshallah tabarak wa ta'ala we to begin our class from the <coughs> book usul as-sitta usul as-sitta ti ya'lif al-shaykh al-islam shaykh al-islami muhammad ibn abdul wahhab Ibn Sulaiman At-Tamimi Al-Najdi Rahimahullah This book is different from the book we just took called Al-Khwa'ad Al-Hurba'u The Four Principles <coughs> Where the Sheikh he talked about four principles Khwa'ad that he <coughs> wanted to explain and prove from the Quran about those people who were in the time of the prophets Allah who were involved in <coughs> making shirk to Allah and defining who they were and the ways to stay away from that which they fell into this book <coughs> is a lot more general but it has a great benefit specifically in the area of <coughs> both Tawheed and methodology. Well, the first book dealt with the issue of Tawheed, which means the worship, the conduct, the singling out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how you deal with, how you worship, how you serve, how you <clears throat> keep Allah in the category by Himself when it comes to His Lordship, when it comes to servitude, when it comes to the names, attributes, and actions, descriptions of Allah, then that was the primary basis for Qawad al-Arba'u, the Four Principles. This one, the Sul of Sittati, <coughs> the four, uh, actually the six uh, principles in this regard, the Sheikh is going to talk about six things. And inshallah ta'ala, nas'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yanfa'ana bi hadhi risala wa nas'ala Allah al-ikhlas wa sadaq wa ta'ala'a بما يظهر من الحق إنه سميع الدعاء إنه على كل شيء قدير وأسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to bless us to have purity in worship sincerity in worship and that we are able to apply and practice follow that which is made clear to us from this book إن شاء الله تعالى we'll begin the treatise of the sheep. Shaykh, he begins by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the one who is most gracious, the one who is most gracious, pardon me, to all of the creation. The one who is most gracious to all of his creation and the one who has a special mercy for the believers. The term Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is comprised of the letter Ba, the letter Ba, Harf Ba, which is the second letter in the alphabet of the Arabic language. And this Ba has various meanings. One of the meanings is when a person seeks to do something, he seeks the assistance by mentioning 
the name of Allah. He seeks the assistance from the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in them by using his name. But the action itself is the thing that is not shown in the statement itself. For example, if I want to drink, then I realize, as the Prophet ﷺ, he used to say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata. There's no situation. There's no occurrence. There's no existence. This is the meaning we get from la hawla. Wa la quwwata. Neither power, no ability, no... <coughs> movement in la billah except by the permission except by the allowance except by the decree of Allah by except by the giving of that thing its existence and its power Allah himself so statement la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah as the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentioned in the authentic collection of Imam Muslim Ibn Hajjaj that this statement is from the treasures Khazan Jannah and it's from the treasures of the paradise to say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah therefore from our belief from our customs from our methodology as Muslims we believe that there is no existence no power no <coughs> ability nor any type of strength except Allah he created it and he gave that thing that ability and strength and so the statement Bismillah that be that you hear this in the word ba <coughs> Aleph Sin Mim which is the <coughs> combination of ba and Ismin which is Bismi. This itself, the ba represents the assistance from Allah. This is the meaning that this ba gives. It's called ba al istaana. Ba al istaana, which the word istaana comes from the word aun, which means help, aid, assistance. And when you add the aleph, the sin, and the ta to the already. Um, foundational letters which is ayn, wow, noon. And in this case it becomes ayn with a madda and a noon. Ista'ana. Then this word ista'ana, the additional letters alif, sin, and ta, for those who know and understand anything about this in Arabic, they mean someone is seeking something. So the alif, sin, and ta is indicative of someone seeking something and the remain in ana which comes from own it means help so this means it's the ana someone seeking help the ba represents that and this is why a person says bismillah rahman rahim meaning i am seeking and whatever the action is whether it's drinking a glass of water going out the front door um, write in a term paper, in this case the shape, write in the book. He's seeking the help of Allah, the aid of Allah, the power from Allah to complete this mission. And he adds a Rahman, a Rahim, a Rahman. As the ulama mentioned, that this is <coughs> a, a name of Allah, which means Lu Rahma, that Allah has the mercy the rahma li khalaiqa li khalqihi jami'ah that Allah has mercy for everything he creates some way somehow there's mercy that Allah gives to all of his creation and then our rahim bi mahna bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim that he's more compassionate and forgiving and merciful to those who believe. So as a general mercy, this is the meaning of a Rahman for everything. And as a specific mercy, 
specifically for the believers. This is the meaning of Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, the one name denotes mercy for everything that Allah created. And Rahim, the name that denotes a special mercy for the believers. So the Shaykh, he starts by saying, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, seeking the assistance of Allah, the most gracious to everything, the most merciful to all of his creation and then the special mercy for the believers and then the shaykh he says Usul Sitta Usul, we said the origin of this word Usul is Asl Usul is the derivative of the word Asl which Asl is a as they call it, a word that is mufrad, it's singular. It's word sometimes in Arabic, singular, sometimes plural, sometimes dual. Here, usul is the plural of asl. And the ulama, they mention an asl, ma yubana alayhi, ma yubana, ma yubana alayhi shay'a. Something that's built on some, or a thing that's built or constructed upon something. So asl, they say, ma yubana alayhi shay'a, something that you have that's built upon something else. So usul means that here are some, for example, verses from the Quran. Here are some hadith statements of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and those statements from Allah and or His Messenger, these things are based and built upon these verses and these statements of the Prophet Muhammad. So the Sheikh is going to present some things that are built upon, based upon, founded upon six principles, and those principles are coming from the religion. That's why it's called, that is the reason the Sheikh named it Usul Asittati, the six things that's founded in the religion that he wants to explain. And of course, there's more than six principles in the religion there's more than uh, six usul there's more than uh, khawaid, four khawaid. but the shaykh he chooses to bring what's best in his time for his people and that which he think um, helps and serves for all of the Muslims so here the shaykh he mentions usul sitta and we will begin with what the shaykh has said in his introduction Paul Rahim Allah Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The Sheikh he says, May Allah have mercy upon the ark of the Sheikh himself. Min Ajibi Ujaba. Min Ajibi Ujaba. The statement means something is very amazing. Ujib is amazement. And this is a high level of amazement. It's not like normal amazement. This is like the epitome of the highest level of amazement is called Ujib. So Sheikh he says Min Ajibil Ujaba from a thing of amazement that reaches the highest level of amazement. The Sheikh he says <laughs> the Shaykh says, and it is a very essential and great portent and a sign of the mere power of Malakul Wallaba. Malakul Wallaba, Malakul Wallaba means the one who owns everything. Everything is at his disposal. Everything belongs to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is conquered by Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nothing can conquer Allah. So the Shaykh, he used the statement, Akbar ayat, a great portent, which is the six principles he's about to mention. Very great. 
Then the shaky goes on. He says, "The Malik al Ghalab means again the one. He is a king, but he has conquered everything. As if you talk about human kings, a king can be defeated, although he's great and he has horsemen and he has servants and he has all of the riches and treasures. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He mentioned." Uh, on the day of judgment it will say we are the ones that own on this day as Allah will be the soul Malik as the Prophet said he will say Ana Malakun. I am the king on this day so here when the Sheikh he describes the Sheikh Muhammad al-Wahhab he says Malik al this means the true king that owns everything and this is a very eloquent way of expression to show that Allah is a true king and that he owns everything he's in control of everything nothing's in control of him everything is in need of him he's not in need of anything he is the creator of everything nothing created him the Sheikh he says sit to usul there are six principles that I want to explain the Sheikh is saying <clears throat> and those six principles, the Sheikh says that those six principles, anha bayanahu bayanahu Allah Taala wadhan lil awam, that Allah has made clear for everyone. That use the word ayam awam, use the word awam. بَيَّنَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَاضِحًا لِلْأَوَامِ Here the Sheikh's statement, Allah did not only mention these six principles. Of course, He mentioned other things in the Qur'an that principles are attached to it. But these six that the Sheikh wants to bring this primary, He's making a profound statement and that is, that Allah has made them clear for the common folk. And the fact that the Shaykh is saying Allah has made them clear, it is a repetition against those who say that the Shaykh Ja'abi and the Shaykh Muhammad Ja'abi Deenin Mada Jadid. That the Shaykh came with a new religion, or you know, that the Shaykh came with that which is and Herat, that which is a deviant religion, or that the Sheikh came Mada bil Gulu wa Shidda, he came with extremism and 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 that which is being overboard. One the Sheikh Jabi took fear wa thorwal and Pilabat and the Sheikh came with revolting and overthrowing governments and and what took fear lil ulama wa mada umara'i muslimin and that the shaykh his intention was to make the blood of the leaders and scholars lawful by falsely accusing them of disbelief har har heresy so that he can wage war upon them this is a proof against all of those things that they say the fact that the shaykh is saying and he's going to prove it in the essay that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala bayyana haan wadihan lil awam that Allah has made these facts these six principles clear for the awam awam means those who are the general people those who may not have a whole bunch of um, religious knowledge or worldly knowledge they're, they're average or below average but still Allah has made it wadihun very clear for them therefore those who have high levels of intellect and education have no excuse if Allah has made it clear for the awam foka dhunna dhannun na foka yadhunna dhannun foka yadhunna dhannun the shaykh he mentions next yani foka yadhunna dhannun he has made it clear in a way that it's beyond what someone could imagine could ever be made clear and this shows that there's no excuse 
for those who are scientists, those who are doctors, those who are um, people who discover, those who um, are on a high level of education and intellect that they disbelieve or don't catch the picture. Rather, it's because of Tababa what I said about them, deaf, dumb, and blind, and they do not understand. That Allah will not change. Ma'abikhoman. Ma'abikhoman here means a ladifi qawman. That which is in a people. As qawman means people. And the ma'abi means that which is inside. And Allah la yagayyiru. Gayyiru means to change. And Allah la yagayyiru. Allah will not change. Yani ma'abikhoman. That which is in the people. Hatta yagayyiru. Hatta yagayyiru ma'abi bi'anfusihim. Until they change that which is in themselves. And this is not talking about, as some people like to use these verses to talk about the conditions in the ghetto. The people selling drugs and on um, alcohol, um, and they have um, substance abuse addictions. They are thuggish, stealing and robbing and killing and uh, being indignant and loitering, hanging out. People like to use this verse and say that Allah will make their condition better. Allah will clean up their neighborhoods until they clean up, until they change what's in themselves. Meaning until they stop drinking, until they change the addiction. But what's meant here is broader than that. What's meant here is broader than that. It's inclusive of every type of disobedience. And this includes the belief until people accept the truth of Allah to Ta'ala, to accept the proper belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to accept the message of Islam wholeheartedly, properly, without changing it, altering and rejecting it, then Allah will allow them to start doing things of righteous deeds, of obedience, that which changes the condition of a people. And this is the meaning of that. So here, when the Shaykh mentions that um, Tabarak wa ta'ala has made this clear. One of the things that's very astonishing, one of the things that's from the major signs that proves that Allah is Malakul Walab, that He is the true king that has conquered everything, that He has made the likes of these six principles the Sheikh is about to bring very clear, even for the Awam, the, the people who are average or lower than average then that means the intellectuals have no excuse. Then after that, the people will have very bright minds and they are very intelligent. They themselves don't get the picture. They have been made to be close-minded to this while Allah has made it clear even for the common folk, the awam. And the shaitan has came to deceive Bani Adam, the children of Adam, and the, um, the sons of Adam, meaning human beings. And the shaykh is mentioned, Illa aqal khalil, meaning from Bani Adam, the, the this is a very small amount of people that have not um, fell into the category of not accepting or understanding the message. The people that understand, there are very few. Those who are confused and led astray are qalil. They are and a little to next to none, as we say. The Sheikh says, Al Asla Awwal. The first principle the Shaykh mentions, Ikhlas Allahi, Ikhlasun Fidin Allahi Wahdahu Nashiri Kala. That is to have sincerity, purity, 
and Allah's deen. Wahdahu la shirikala, and to make him alone without any partners. Wa bayan didhahi alladhi huwa shirka billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to make clear and to clarify that which is the opposite of ikhlas, the shirk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَوْنَ هَذَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ أَكْثَرَ فِي أَكْثَرَ وَجُودِ شَتَّى The Shaykh, he says, and this has been mentioned in various ways in the Qur'an, this issue of the shirk and the ikhlas, the ikhlas and the opposite of shirk. Allah has mentioned this in various places in the Qur'an. بِكَلَامْ يَفْحَمَهُ أَبْلَقُ الْآمَّةِ with the type of speech that the majority of people who are merely common folk can understand. Then most of the people, and here Akhtara Ummati could mean two things. As the Prophet he said, when talking about the people who hear the message but they don't accept it. The, sh the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَهُودِيًّا وَنَسْرَانِيًّا يَسْمَعَ Minni Yasma'a 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 Minni Min Hadhil Ummah Akama Khan. Rasulullah he said there was not any single one from the Jews and the Christians that hear of my message, that hear of this call of Islam from my Ummah. From the likes of the statement, Ummah is understood from two perspectives. You have the Ummah to Da'wah. An ummah means a nation of people or people in general. And then you have ummatu istijab. Ummatu istijaba. And a group of people that seek to answer the call. So ummah is either talking about everybody that was alive during the time of the Prophet. And they heard his call, be a Jew, Christian, uh, Majus, fire worshipper, um, be a, 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 a Mushrikuna or Walloon, the pagan Arabs, be it whoever. They were alive during the time of the Prophet, and he's Prophet now, and they heard of his message. Or min ummati, or from my nation, could mean those who heard. The call they accepted Islam like we say we are Muslims. So here, you know, the Sheikh he says, and Allah has explained it very clear for the average, the majority of the common folk to understand. <laughs> then it has became the Masara Akhtara Ummati. Now then most of my nation. It could be understood all of the people a little bit except from amongst the people became astray meaning they did not listen to the message they turned away after having a fair chance or it can mean most of the Muslims are astray and a small number of the Muslims are guided they accepted the message as a tabaraku wa ta'ala he mentioned um, Everyone rejoicing in his, yani, his, his group. And the Prophet he said in the Hadith, Akrajuhu, Imam Abi Dawood, he said in the collection of Imam Abi Dawood and others, he said, Yahud. Tayyib Khalan Nabi Yusallam, 
يعني فتفرقوا يهود إحدى وسبعون إحدى وسبعين فرقة وتفرقوا نصراني إثنى وسبعين فرقة وسفتركوا أمتي على ثلاثة وسبعين فرقة كلهم في النار إلا واحد الحديث فبسلم he said with the meaning in English so the Jews have divided themselves into 71 sects and the Christians have divided themselves into 72 sects and my nation in the future meaning after he dies they will divide themselves into 73 sects all of them are in the fire except one so this hadith explains the whole concept again of Ummah. Ummah either meaning everybody including the Jews, Christians and the Muslim they are considered Ummah. Meaning they are the people that have received um, the call. They are the people that were around that knew about the coming of Muhammad and they were invited. Then you have the other side those who accepted meaning they became Muslim but they themselves became into sex after the death of the Prophet. All of them were being the fire except the ones that follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the way of the Sahaba. So you have two ways to look at this. Either it's talking about all of the Muslims who go to Jannah, and even if some have to go to the hellfire, or the other Billah, and burn, they will all go to Jannah. And the ones that won't go to Jannah are those who reject the message. Or the Muslims that will go to Jannah or the people of the Sunnah who held to the belief firstly of the Prophet and the Sahaba and if they had some sins either they will purify themselves in the fire after time Allah will pull them out and they will go to paradise or Allah will forgive them and they will go to paradise and then all of the other groups that didn't follow the Sunnah they innovated and they made sex in groups they will be in the fire and they won't go to Jannah because of the level of bid'ah, the level of uh, making a new religion, bringing things into the religion that Prophet Sallam did not sanction, neither did Allah sanction. So here when you talk about the issue that the Sheikh is mentioning, where the common folk, Allah has revealed it, where well, common folk can understand, and that means elite, where well, people have average intellect, they can understand, and that means people with awesome minds, the people who are normally the poor and the downtrodden, if they can understand, then I mean the people who are rich and on top of everything, then they have no excuse, as it is made for everyone to understand. The way that they have been deceived, Atharahumul Shaytan, the Shirk, the Tanaka Saw, the Tanaka Saw, the Tanaka Saw, the Tanaka Saw, the They, they have been fooled by the devil. They have been fooled by Shaytan. He has made appear to them, or brought to their attention that there is a way to become close to Allah by going extreme with the righteous by going extreme with the people that were from their people or had a level of righteousness and obedience to Allah so this is one way that the people fell into shirk which is the opposite of al-ikhlas this is one of the ways that those people who were the intellectuals, those people that had minds, fell into shirk and they left the issue of ikhlas, which is the first principle the Sheikh is mentioning, the issue of ikhlas, having sincerity, having purity of religion, purity of the deen, purity in your asking Allah, purity in your devotion, purity in your salat, purity in your fasting, that you don't mix an action of worship for Allah and someone else, but that you keep it for Allah alone. 
that you do it, believe, and that you will get the reward from Allah. And you also do it, believe, and that it's the obligation that is part of the religion. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned and the Hadith of Bukhari Muslim about fasting in Ramadan. He said, Man Sama Ramadan and Iman and Wahdisaban, Wofur Allahu Matta Qaddam and Dambi. Whosoever fasts in Ramadan, point number one, and he believes Iman. Iman meaning he does it because he believes it's an obligation, like Allah and his messenger said. And not that he fasts or she fasts and say, Well, I don't believe I have to, but I just like to do it. If he say, I believe that it's not an obligation, but I'm doing it because of this reason or that reason. I'm fasting because I want to lose weight only. I'm fasting because it gives me a good feeling spiritually. I'm fasting because my boyfriend is Muslim and I want to fast along with the Muslims, but I don't believe that you should fast, you have to fast. I believe it's up to you. Then this means that person is not fasting with khalas. And the Prophet he said, Iman and showing the person must believe about their fast with Allah and his messenger said about the fast. Wahdi Sabin, that they only seek a reward from Allah, the mighty, the sublime, not a reward or a praise from someone else for the action. So this is one of the issues of ikhlas, that you do it because Allah ordained it, that you do it solely to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the mighty the sublime and that you don't do it to be seen you don't do it to show off you don't do it to be praised and some people they misunderstand this when we talk about working with the capacity of a teacher or imam say oh well he's getting paid or she's seeking a wage this is not for Allah's sake no when you have to um, do a job and someone hires you. This has nothing to do with the sincerity. The sincerity lies in the heart why a person is doing it. Maybe a person could go and get a better job, making twenty five, thirty thousand, but he decides he or she decides to take this job because they want to help the Muslims and <clears throat> be a benefit towards the religion. And they know that the money is a cut in this life, but the reward is greater than the hereafter. So this is a sign of ikhlas, sincerity. And not that they should be judged because they're taking a wage, as if they should do it for nothing. And if they do it for a wage, then this is not ikhlas. No, this is uh, a misunderstanding. Likewise, in the issue of the salihin, where the shaitan, the shaykh is saying, he has made it appear, he has put it in the minds and in the hearts of the people, the issue of going overboard with the righteous people. Many times the people believe and understand this point when it comes to the deceased. People going to the grave, praying to the deceased, asking the deceased to take the request to Allah, or that they may slaughter some animal because they are afraid that that righteous person could harm them. He himself can cause them some harm, or that he may bring some benefit to them. Then, in this case, we understand that this is going too far with the righteous. But it also includes to go far with the righteous that are alive, such as the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, <clears throat> And I want you to be aware of being extreme. Because indeed, one of the things that destroy the nations before you is extremism. So here the Sheikh is talking about how the Shaitan has made it appear to people to take their righteousness in a manner of extremism. But this does not only mean those who are dead, like grave worshippers, and, and sacrificing animals for the deceased, and hoping that those deceased can ward off evil and bring you about good. It includes being overboard with the righteous that are alive, with the righteous that are alive, such as obeying leadership and what Allah has made wrong, or such as taking the position 
of an individual who was a sheikh or alim because of that person himself, because he's so-and-so, then I have to take his position because he's so sheikh so-and-so, or because he has any uh, knowledge from a particular place, then he has to be followed. This is the same type of glue that which the sheikh is talking about with the righteous. <clears throat> the Sheikh also mentions aside from this Rahimahullah Tanaqas al-Salihin wa qasui fi haqoqihim now, yani that you go too far as it relates to the righteous by um, putting them on a pedestal or raising them even in some cases to the level of prophet. Yani the devajat nabuwa al ila devajat yani ilahiya. He's either raising them to a level of godship, deity ship, or to prophecy, but also by you know, uh, diminishing their rights. And their rights is that you keep them as righteous people. This is their right. And you praise them for the good that they have, but that you don't take them out of their realm and place them somewhere else. This is not giving them the rights. So when you have extremism with the righteous people, you not only raise them to a level that they should be, but you also take away from the rights that's due to them at the same time. This is one of the points the Sheikh is making, Rahimahullah. And the Shaytan didn't stop there. He also, Athabalahum, the Sheikh says, Wa Athabalahum, Yani Shirk, Mada, the Muhammad Salihin. And he also made the people make partners with Allah by way of expressing your love for those righteous people. So you have two things. You have uh, actually three things. You have the Tanakh al-Salihin by raising them to a high level. Either prophecy, uh, de deity ship, or to make them, uh, because who they are, they have to be followed. Like many of the madahib, like there's um, some statements people made in order to show their preference over one imam to another because who he were, who he, that person he was. Like we mentioned in the tafsir class, the famous forged hadith for those who want to attract people to their uh, teacher or their uh, way or their scholar or their madhab or their style of teaching or their views that they learned. They said, In the whole, you call a gradualon, you call a gradualon, Muhammad ibn Idris, who are al Muslimin, men al Iblis. There is a man. And they attribute this to the Prophet. Prophet Salam was supposed to have said, and they invented this, they made it up and said that the Prophet said there will be a man that will be said about him, his name was Muhammad ibn Idris. This is Imam al Shafi'i. He said he will be more harmful and dangerous upon the Muslims than Iblis. Ismuhu Abi Hanifa, Taj Ummah, Saradin. And there will be another man who will come. His name will be Abu Hanifa. He is the crown.